chapter 10, Creating the Fear. The secret elite has always had a handle on the press. The newspapers have immense power to influence how people think and act. Important events in public life, including appointments and elections, are swayed by them. They like to portray themselves as standard bearers of morality, for loyalty, for what is for the good, for what, for what is for the public good. When they get it right, they promote themselves with unconscionable arrogance. When they get it wrong, they simply move on to the next opinion. Few have absolute loyalty to a political party. They smell the wind and change their allegiance accordingly. But their concerted attacks can bring down politicians or blacken the character of public figures. Newspapers serve their owners and always have. When their owners are part of the greater conspiracy, democracy itself becomes a fraud. Viscount Milner, Viscount Alfred Milner, understood the role of the power of the press. From his earliest years in the Paul Gazette, Paul Mall Gazette in the 1880s, Milner's personal network of journalist friends included William T. Stead, editor of the Review of Reviews, George Buckle, and later Geoffrey Dawson at the Times. Edmund Garrett at the Westminster Gazette and E.T. Cook at the Daily News and Daily Chronicle. All were members of the secret elite. The combined impact of these newspapers and magazines gave the secret elite great influence over public opinion by directing editorial policies from behind the scenes. But it was the intimacy between the Times and the Foreign Office the colonial office and the war office that demonstrated just how deeply the symbolic relationship ran. Milner's good friends, Milner's good friend, the Times correspondent Flora Shaw, had been a welcome guest at the colonial office and was in the confidence of all concerned with imperial policy. Her task in justifying war in South Africa had been to insist day after day in the Times that. President Kruger was refusing to address legitimate grievances in the Transvaal. Flora Shaw was also given the opportunity to rewrite history. The Times sponsored an updated Encyclopedia Britannica, and she was invited to revise the Imperial sections, a task that involved rewriting a great many articles. The connection between the Times and the Foreign Office continued through another known member of the secret elite, Valentine Chirol. Formerly a foreign office clerk, Chirol moved to Berlin as the Times correspondent before returning to London to take control of their foreign depart department. From this powerful position, Chirol promoted secret elite policies from 15 for 15 years up to 1912. What he supported through his editorials became the policies that the government followed. With unerring certainty, he promoted the Boer War, the Anglo-Japanese Alliance, the Entente Cordiale, the 1907 agreement with Tsarist Russia, and increasing antagonism towards Germany. Charles Repington, as we have seen, was yet another Times correspondent whose involvement in secret intergovernment agreements belied his journalistic role. His access to foreign office and war office civil servants, diplomats, and secret papers went far beyond propriety. The Times was taken over and controlled by Milner's men in much the same way as they took control of All Souls College in Oxford, quietly and without a struggle. Others might own the newspaper, but he ensured that its editorial leadership came from within the secret elite's trusted ranks. Members of the innermost circle swarmed all over the Times, writing editorials and articles, submitting news and views in line with their agenda. Professor Quigley stated that up to, 19, that up to 1912, the older order inside the elite 
Those initially associated with Lord Salisbury were in charge, but after the point controlled passed seamlessly passed seamlessly to Milner's close and trusted friend, Geoffrey Dawson. Like all his favorites, Dawson had been personally recruited by Alfred Milner, originally for work in South Africa. He poached him from the colonial office in 1901 and had him appointed editor of the Johannesburg Star before he left Africa in 1905. When George Buckle was approaching the end of his tenure as editor of the Times, Dawson was sent for, spent a year hanging about the offices, and was duly appointed editor-in-chief in 1912. That was how the secret elite worked, always one step ahead of the rest, sometimes two. The Times could not boast a mass circulation. It never pretended to be a vehicle for mass propaganda. What Milner and his secret elite associates understood clearly was that the Times influenced the small, that small number of important people who had the capacity to influence others. It represented the, the governing class, that elite of political, diplomatic, financial, wealth-bearing, favored few who made and improved choices for themselves and for others. It was part of the whole process through which the secret elite directed policy by endorsing those elements that met their approval and deriding contrary opinion. When, for example, a member of the secret elite announced a policy on national defense, it would be backed up in an independent study by an eminent Oxford don or former military expert analyzed and approved in a Times leader and legitimized in a Times ledger and legitimized by some publication favorably reviewed in the Times literary supplement. Everyone involved in the process would be in some way associated with or approved by the secret elite, including the writer of the anonymous review. The revolution in newspaper circulation with its popular daily papers, magazines, and pamphlets bypassed the times in the first years of the 20th century, but did not alter its focus. The paper was, however, ailing and in danger of running at an unsustainable loss. Its savior, Alfred Hamsworth, was on first consideration an unlikely guardian of the secret elite's public voice. As leader of the yellow press, a term of utter contempt derived from the sensationalist journalism developed in New York at the turn of the century, Harmsworth did not naturally belong inside the elite. But as his extensive stable proved, sensationalism sold newspapers, sold newspapers and they wielded immense influence. He bought up a very large section of the London-based press including the Daily Mail, the Daily Mirror, the Daily Graphic, Evening News, and Weekly Dispatch. If he was not from the natural constituencies that bred Britain's elite, he was close to them. Harmsworth had been very supportive of Af Alfred Milner during the Boer War, and his Daily Mail gave great prominence to Percy Fritz Patrick, the Transvaal from within, which helped promote the need for war. It brought him great profit. He spent large sums of money on stories that helped the circulation of the Daily Mail rise to over a million. Kipling's poems, Kipling's poem, The Absent-Minded Beggar, was bought by his Daily Mail, set to music, and sold to raise tens of thousands of pounds for ambulances and provisions for the troops. Harmsworth was an innovator, he convinced C Cecil Rhodes to give him an exclusive and entirely favorable interview, which he published throughout the civilized world, having been forewarned by his secret elite contacts that Arthur Balfour was about to resign in 1905. He scooped the story in an in, an in, in depth interview. He scooped the story in an in-depth interview with the Prime Minister that included his plans for a great election, for a general election. Harmsworth was ennobled by King Edward that same year, took the title of Lord Northcliffe, 
and was increasingly drawn into the secret elite circles. Gaining control of the times was not straightforward. Northcliffe had a serious rival in Sir Arthur Pearson, proprietor of the Daily Express, and both bought up a stock bought up stock from the 68 major shareholders. Northcliffe was the secret elite's chosen, chosen man. His loyalty to the empire, Milner and the king shone through. Lord Escher was sent to vet him on their behalf, since it was vital that the policy of the times remained unchanged. Aided by the general manager, Marberly Bell, to whom he also had to make promises that the times of the for the times of the future would be conducted in on the same lines as the times of the past. Northcliffe gathered fifty one percent of the company stock and announced his ownership on the twenty seventh of june nineteen o eight Any fears that the editors, journalists, correspondents, and readers might have expressed before his acquisition were quickly dispelled. For the only noticeable change he introduced was to the price. It fell from three pence to one penny. Northcliffe was a valuable contributor to the secret elite in their drive to vilify the Kaiser, and his newspapers constantly repeating the warning that Germany was the enemy. In story after story, the message of the German danger to the British Empire, the British products, to British in story after story the message of the German danger to the British Empire to British products to British national security was constantly repeated not every newspaper followed suit but the right-wing press was particularly virulent in addition Northcliffe had by 1908 bought up the Observer and the Sunday Times According to Professor Quigley, the definitive assurance given by Northcliffe to the secret elite that their policies would be willingly supported brought him into the confidence of the society of the society of the elect. What made Northcliffe and his associated newspapers so valuable was that the long term plan to alienate public opinion against Germany could progress on two levels. The Times manipulated the elite opinion in Britain molding policy and poisoning the climate, while the Daily Mail and its sister newspapers created sensational stories against Germany that excited the gullible of all classes. The Morning Post, whose unquestioning support for the myth of Winston Churchill's great, exca great escape in the Boer War propelled him into politics, always promoted traditionally conservative views. It was even more committed to the secret elite, because after 1905, when one of its own, Fabian Ware, became editor, a friend and trusted colleague of Milner himself, Ware ensured that the Morning Post ensured the Morning the Morning Post's unstinting support against Germany. A large and influential section of the British press was working to the rabid agenda of the secret elite and poisoning the minds of a whole nation. It was part of a propaganda drive that was sustained right up to and throughout the First World War. If the Times was their influential base, if the Times was their intellectual base, the popular dailies spread the gospel of anti-German hatred to the working classes. From 1905 to 1914, sp spy stories and anti-German articles bordered on lunacy. In the years prior to the Entente Cordiale, the villain in scare stories and invasion claims had been France. In, 19, in 1893, Lord Northcliffe, or Hansworth as he was then, commissioned the magazine serial called The Poison Bullet, in which Britain was attacked one evening by the combined forces of Russia and France. His aim was to stir public concern and underline the need for a larger fleet. The complete about-face and foreign policy at the start of the 20th century was mirrored by the about-turn in popular storylines. It was Germany who was now spying on Britain, not France. 
It was Germany who was now plotting the downfall of British Empire. It was Germany who was now the villain. The author of the poison bullet was the Walter was the Walter Mitty of spy scare stories. William Le Keux. This was a man who found an extremely popular niche in cheap novels and scare stories and made a fortune from them. His patron was none other than Lord Northcliffe. While the Times took a more highbrow approach to diplomacy and foreign policy, Northcliffe indulged in base or anti-German vitriol through the Daily Mail, where the editor, Ken- Kennedy Jones, operated on the basis of writing for their meanest intelligence. Northcliffe knew exactly what that entailed and was convinced that the British public liked a good hate. It was the perfect combination. By targeting Germany as the font of evil, the hate and the irrational spy and invasion stories gave the Northcliffe stables rich material to boost circulation and promote the war to which the secret elite were committed. The literary war began in earnest in 1903 with the publication of er of Erskine Childers' best-selling novel, The Riddle of the Sands, which sounded the warnings of a forthcoming German seaborne invasion of England. Written from a patriot sense of duty, the riddle of the sands was an epic of its time, with secret plans that had seven ordered fleets from seven shallow outlets, carrying an invasion army across the North Sea, protected by the Imperial German Navy. He claimed it was written to stir public opinion so that slumbering statesmen would take action against the German menace. His novel galvanized the Admiralty to station a fleet permanently in the North Sea and brought Richard Haldane's plans plans to create a general staff for the army, more popular support. As his biographer later claimed, Childer's book remained the most powerful contribution to the debate on Britain's alleged unpreparedness for war for a decade. His was the single literary contribution that had merit and was the forerunner to John Buchanan, John Le Carre, Le Carre, John Le Carre, John Le Carre, and Ian Flemings. In March of 1906, Northcliffe commissioned William Le Q, Le QX, to write The Invasion of 1910, another scare serial published in the Daily Mail. It wasn't it was utter drivel, badly written but meticulously researched. LeCue spent several months touring an imaginary invasion route in the southeast of England, assisted by the aging former military legend and favored son of the secret elite, Lord Roberts and Kandahar. Lord Roberts of Kandahar and the Daily Mail's naval correspondent, H.W. Wilson. Let's do that again. Lake Q spent several months touring an imaginary invasion route in the southeast of England, assisted by the aging former military legend and favored son of the secret elite, Lord Roberts of Kandahar, and the Daily Mail's naval correspondent, H.W. Wilson. The chosen route included too many rural communities where circulation could never reach, could never amount to much. So in the so in the interest of maximum profit and maximum upset, Northcliffe altered the route to allow the invaders to terrorize every major town from Sheffield to Clemsford. The Daily Mail even printed special maps to accompany each each edition to show where the invading Hums Huns would strike the next day. It was an outrageous attempt to generate fear and resentment towards Germany. The personal involvement of Lord Northcliffe, Lord Roberts, who had been commander-in-chief of the army and a member of the Committee of Imperial Defense, 
and the naval historian Hubert Wrigley's Wilson gave the impression that this was a work based on reality, not fiction. In an act of mutual self-admiration, Lord Roberts publicly commended the novel to all those to all who had the British Empire at heart, and LeCue endorsed Lord Roberts' call for conscription to the armed forces. The invasion of 1910 was translated into 27 languages and sold over a million copies, though to LeCue's great embarrassment and considerable anger in the pirated and, unab and abridged German version, it was the Germans who won. Northcliffe was offensive and meant to be so. He explained his philosophy in an interview with the French newspaper Le Matin. We detest the Germans cordially. They make themselves odious to the whole of Europe. I will not allow my paper, paper The Times, to publish anything which might in any way hurt the feelings of the French but I would not like to print anything which might be agreeable to the Germans. He was, as the Belgian ambassador in London, noted to his superiors in 1907, poisoning at pleasure the mind of an entire nation. He was indeed, but it was with the approval of the secret elite, whose ultimate success required fear and loathing to stir a hatred of Germany. These ridiculous, poorly written, and utterly outrageous stories raised the fear factor. People really believed that a German invasion was possible, likely even. And the subtext, the very worrying additional threat that grew in the wake of this manipulation of public opinion, was the spy menace. Suddenly, the nation had been secretly infiltrated by thousands, no hundreds of thousands of spies. Success breeds imitation, and LeCue soon found his spy plots and storylines about the German menace being pirated by other authors. E. Phillips Oppenheim began his own crusade against German militarism, writing 116 barely readable and justifiably forgotten novels that made him a fortune. These included the revelation that the Kaiser intended to rule the German Empire from London, Oppenheim claimed that 290,000 young men, all trained soldiers, were in place, posing as clerks, waiters, and hairdressers, with orders to strike at the heart of Britain when the moment came. The spy mania sparked a forest fire whose heat generated genuine political concern. Even level-headed editors had trouble keeping the issue of spies and spying in perspective. By 1909, the net elect... The net effect of LeCue and fellow charlatans who had jumped on this bandwagon to arouse a sleeping nation to a non-existent peril was national paranoia. The combination of the so-called naval race and the, sp and the specter of spies and the spectra of spies around every corner bred a rampant fear of Germany. The fiction was peddled as truth in the nation the National Review, the Quarterly Review, and a whole host of editorials in the national press. These fantasies were swallowed whole by a readership far beyond what Winston Churchill called the inmates of Bedlam and the writers in the National Review. Secret elite approval was reflected in Lord Esther's warning. A nation that believes itself secure, all history teaches is doomed. Anxiety, not a sense of security, lies at the readiness for war. An invasion scare is the will of God which grinds you a navy of dreadnoughts and keeps the British people in warlike spirit. The will of God, indeed. It was the will of the secret elite allied to its soulmates in the armaments industry. By the autumn of 1907, Balfour and his conservative and the conservative oppos opposition, bolstered by the press campaign, persuaded the government to appoint a further subcommittee of the Committee of Imperial Defense to consider the invasion threat. The 
consider the invasion threat. The inmates were in danger of taking over the asylum. The subcommittee met 16 times between November 1907 and July of 1908. And their report, published in October, rejected all of the invasion theories and surprise attack scenarios. Such a message did not suit the secret elite, nor those promoting increasing spending on the Navy. Balfour, Lansdowne, and the conservatives portrayed it as whitewash. A further subcommittee of the CID was set up in March of 1909 by Richard Haldane to examine the nature and extent of foreign espionage in Britain. It recommended the creation of the British Secret Intelligence Bureau, a national intelligence service to operate both at home and abroad. Haldane, who had been elevated to the House of Lords, moved the second reading of the Official Secrets Act in July 1911, stressing that this, that his bill emanated from the deliberations of the Committee of Imperial Defense. The first noble lord who rose to approve Haldane's bill was both his and Lord Milner's friend, Viscount Middleton, previously known as St. John Broderick, former Secretary of State of War, of State for War. Such was the pressure to meet public expectation that the bill was rushed through its second and third readings in the House of Commons in a single afternoon, with no detailed scrutiny and minimal debate. Thus, Asquith's liberal government approved the setting up of what was to become the British Secret Service through the act of Parliament that was little more than a crisis reaction to public hysteria. How ironic that the imaginary spies and outrageous scare stories from LeCue and his ilk were responsible for the Secret Service Bureau. From these green shoots planted in a flower bed of fear and suspicion, both M15 and M16 were to grow into huge departments of national insecurity. The deliberate undermining of public confidence by the press and the excessive claims of imminent danger to the nation's survival voiced in Parliament and newspapers alike, slowly but surely eroded tolerance and trust. Liberal England was made to feel vulnerable. The influx of Polish and Russian refugees from the Jewish pog pogroms, pogroms in the early years of the 20th century had placed great social pressure on the east end of London and a royal commission recommended the introduction of controls on their entry. These were not spies. They were desperately needy refugees, but fear of the foreigner now lurked deep in the national psyche. They became the victim, victims of Britain's first Aliens Act, a long-held tradition of secure, of succor, of succour for distressed people, was the first casualty of the paranoia. The mounting friction of bogus spy stories broke the resolve of Britain's traditional freedoms. The foreigner might not be what he seemed. The immigrant became a cause for concern, where previously the proud tradition of liberalism made Britain a safe haven for the oppressed. The officials, the official secret acts, Secrets Act went much further than any any before by empowering the authorities to arrest without warrant. Freedoms eroded are rarely freedoms restored. What the official secret acts, what the official secrets act and the secret service bureau achieved was greater protection for the secret elite. The ordinary man or woman on the streets of London, Birmingham or Glasgow had no need to be safeguarded against imaginary boogeymen, nor had they anything to hide. The secret elite had much they needed to keep from the public's eye. Illicit agreements, illegal commercial deals, secret international treaties, preparations for war. This was what the Official Secrets Act was really about. The secret elite had made a vital move to further protect its own interests, not those of the British people. Summary, 
Chapter 10, Creating the Fear With his personal knowledge of the power of newspapers, Alfred Milner ensured that the secret elite gained control of a large section of the British press. The most important British newspapers, the time was given unprecedented access to the foreign, colonial, and war offices. The secret elite vetted and approved Alfred Hansworth as the new owner of the Times in 1908. Because of his unstinting support for Milner and the Boer War and his anti-German sympathies, Harmsworth also controlled a large stable of popular newspapers with mass readership. Such was his value to the secret elite that he was elevated to the peerage as Lord Northcliffe. Henceforth, he operated close to the inner circle. Northcliffe promoted deliberately concocted scare stories in his papers, including German invasion of England and the country being infiltrated by vast numbers of German spies. The ultimate aim was to undermine public confidence, create a menace where none existed, and introduce legislation that eroded freedoms and protected the secret elite.